YouTube. I am back with another video. Uh, this time on Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, uh, which is one of the classics of the sci-fi genre and the book I wonder why I didn't read ages ago because it really did live up to the hype, or at least for me. So yeah, like I said, it's widely regarded as a classic of the sci-fi genre, so this really sets a very high bar in terms of expectations. Uh, and especially with sci-fi, there's always the question, you know, is the book still relevant? Did it become obsolete? Um, you know, with any classical sci-fi, it's almost inevitable that you're going to find some anachronisms. You know, things that seemed very futuristic at the time and are predicted to only happen, you know, centuries in the future. Um, but we already have them today, or things that are now very common that are completely missed, like uh, the internet. Um, so, yeah, so, for example, this book uh, was written in the 70s and although it's set in some indeterminate future uh, the way for example computers pervade society are very much kind of in the 70s style um, much less ubiquitous, ubiquitous than we would expect today um, but yeah what is the book about um, and what did I think of it I will be slightly spoilery um, in this discussion so yeah if you don't want any spoilers at all still stay away but uh, I won't spoil too much of the plot it's not too much that can be spoiled because it is very much uh, a novel of ideas and that's also part of the reason why it still holds up because the ideas are still relevant so what are ideas well uh, in the dispossessed uh, Le Guin looks at how we organize society and how we live together. So we have these two kind of twin worlds. One is described as a moon of the other, but it's large enough to have a breathable atmosphere. Uh, Eurus and Anaris. And on Eurus is a world very much like our own, or like our own was in say the 70s and 80s during the Cold War. So there are these two superpowers. One is a capitalist society and one is a state communist society. And they have this kind of Cold War and uh, proxy warfare thing going on. Um, whereas on Anaris, uh, it's a moon which was settled by people that were kind of exiled from Euros uh, one and a half to two centuries previously. Uh, and on Anaris, they founded an anarchistic society where private property is abolished and it goes to such a level that uh, they speak a constructed language which doesn't even have possessive pronouns, right? So you can't say, this is my book. You can only say, this is the book I am reading, or this is the book that sits on my shelf, or the book that I use. Uh, and we kind of look at these societies through the lens of experiences of Shevek, uh, presumably supposed to be this person on the cover here, uh, who is a physicist born on Anaris, uh, who later travels to Eurus. Uh, and by looking at his life and what happens to him and his conversations with people, we kind of examine these societies. And like I said, it's a novel of ideas, so uh, the main point is to examine these societies and how society should be organized. Uh, and, and so it doesn't go completely in the, some novels of ideas, you know, they, they really go full on the idea and completely discard plots and characters in favor of that. So this book doesn't go that far, which makes it a lot more readable. Um, so the, the characters are well-rounded and human. Uh, there is something of a plot, although it's not, you know, it won't keep you at the edge of your seat, um, but it's, it's still enjoyable. And um, things do happen, let's say. Uh, but both the plot and the characters kind of exist to allow us to examine these societies rather than uh, to examine the characters themselves, right? And so, like I said, the, the point is to, to examine these societies, and especially to examine anarchism and contrast that to the societies in Euros, right? So you, you might expect in the 70s, you know, either when, of course, the, the ideological conflict on our world was between democracy slash capitalism versus communism, uh, and you might expect an author to kind of pick one of those sides, but Le Guin consciously does not do that, right? So there's Euros, which has both capitalism and communism going on, although we see mostly see the communist society, which, uh, sorry, the capitalist society, and there's some small critiques of the communist society, 
but it's contrasted with an anarchistic society. Right? Rather than, and although there's no property in this anarchistic society or no private property, it's not communist in the sense that there's no central state. Right? Everything's organized anarchistically, there are no laws, there's no police, there's a quasi parliamentary body, but they can't actually make binding resolutions as such, they can only offer advice. Um, and that makes it so, so it's not, you know, arguing in favor of communism, uh, as you could expect, but it's, you know, contrasting this with a completely different organization. Uh, and throughout it kind of looks at, you know, the pros and cons of the anarchistic society and kind of gets you to question, you know, how does government work? How does morality work? Do we need laws and how and why uh, should they be implemented? And that is the great strength of the book. I think that's why it holds up that it invites all these questions. Uh, at the same time, that also uh, is paradoxically almost its weakness that it invites those questions. Um, and, and its weakness because because it invites you to kind of poke around and identify the flaws in the systems that are presented, you start to find doing that and, and finding them and things start to unravel a bit, at least they did for me. So one thing to note is that although an is an anarchistic society and it's tempting to kind of see that as, kind of, as being portrayed as an ideal, it's not entirely clear if Le Guin actually meant it that way, right? It's an examination of an anarchistic society, but it's not necessarily claiming that this would be the ideal society and we should start a revolution tomorrow to found it. Right? And throughout, um, Le Guin is not afraid to have her character suffer consequences for the fact that her society is not ideal or perfect. Uh, and I can contrast that with uh, the mandibles, right? Lionel Shriver. So uh, if you don't want to avoid spoilers for this, um, wait until I will uh, mute this video or skip ahead until I put the book down again. So Lionel Shriver similarly looks at kind of contemporary society and the problems and flaws that exist in it and imagines a different way of organizing society, especially towards the end uh, when the mandibles arrive in uh, what's the free state of Nevada, which it's not state as such, but you kind of get the sense that that is how Shriver imagines an ideal society to be. And although the book acknowledges the flaws in that society and then, you know, the downsides of living in the society of, of Nevada, some other characters never really uh, suffer any of those consequences, right? So, Although this kind of knowledge that these flaws exist, they never really shown to exist. You can kind of imagine they would only happen to other people or not really be that important. Right? Whereas, in contrast, the Gwen uh, in The Dispossessed, you know, has bad stuff happen to a character uh, as a consequence of society being flawed, right? Because society is flawed, this bad stuff can happen. So, it really visually shows you uh, the flaws that exist in society. But what was the, the main, I don't want to call it an issue of the book as such, because this, this criticism kind of veers into the book not being the book I wanted it to be, rather than me criticizing what the book actually is. But what I was missing was the systemic view and critique of these societies. So, I think partly that's because we explore them solely through the lens of Shevek, right? That's the only really point of view character that we follow. And because of that, we, we only get to see incidents. So, we get to see, uh, for example, you know, Shevek is at this, this physics uh, institute and he has this boss who can block his publications, is very influential. And it's kind of shown as an Kind of, again, yeah, it's a flaw in the society, so society isn't living to up to its ideals and therefore this can exist, but it's missing the fundamental point that it's inherent to the structure of an Arab society that such situations would continue to occur, 
right? So, because there is a limited printing press, not everybody, you know, to publish as you were, you have to go through a press, and people are able to gain influence and thereby, because of their scientific status or ideas, and thereby control who gets to have their work published, right? And it's okay, you, Sabo is maybe a bad egg or bad apple, but it's, it's kind of inherent in the way the system is set up that people could attain that position, right? So even if you were to get rid of Sabo, the same situation could occur again. And although it's supposed to be an anarchistic society, Right? You can start poking holes into that and you see that because although there's no private property, right, and that would remove a lot of kind of um, motivation for crimes, right, if you nobody owns anything, you can't steal anything, you can't extort people because where are you going to extort from them, etc. But it's missing the ways in which there is still scarcity, and I think as long as there's scarcity, you can extort or steal. Right, so, um, for example, they have these communal domiciles, right, you don't own a, a room, you just go up to a place and say, I need a room, and one gets assigned to you. But not all rooms are entirely equal, right? There are features that make one room more desirable than another. And there doesn't seem to be any mechanism in anorexia society other than relying on the inherent goodness of people to prevent people from kind of exploiting that, right? If, if a bunch of people get together and agree that they'll beat up anyone who doesn't give up the nicest drums to them, there's nothing you can do about that other than try and gather even more people to beat up those people, right? There's no, there doesn't seem to be any kind of mechanism of counterbalancing or preventing anybody from using violence to gain power over others in their society. Uh, and there are definitely avenues to gain and hold power, even though it's supposedly an anarchistic society, right? We see that there are factions, we see that there are people of influence. Um, Shevek eventually even gets into a position where he literally has the power of life and death over people because he gets to decide how to allocate food. And he seems to try to do it honestly, and he didn't like that responsibility at all. But as is pointed out in the conversation he has about it, there are always people willing to make those kind of lists and people who would seek out that power and would abuse that power, right? And, and maybe not even maliciously at first, but, you know, when you are in a position where you can decide who gets full rations or not and thereby potentially who lives or dies, people will try to seek to influence your decisions, even if you yourself only have noble aims, right? And naturally, you know, someone might say, well, my partner or, you know, really needs the food and try to induce you to, to make sure that partner keeps receiving full rations. But so inherent in an arrestee society, although it pretends to be anarchistic, there are still positions of power and influence and kind of the book acknowledges incidental abuses of power in NRSC society but it doesn't really unearth the paradoxical fact that the society as it is structured inherently makes those abuses of power possible and it therefore also really doesn't offer a solution for them and like I said it's, it's I don't want to make that a, a critique of the book as such because the fact that I noticed these issues and then thought about them is really down to the book, right? It invites you to think about the society and to engage critically with it and to try and poke holes in the ideals that are presented to you, not just in an RST society, but also in the society of URS, right? It's also presented in a certain fashion and you're invited to kind of try and poke the holes in that and at once it's easier because uh, Euros is a capitalistic society, so, or at least the, the part of Euros that Shevek visits is capitalistic, so all the critiques of that are familiar, whereas uh, Anaris is an 
ideal society in the sense of being abstract and, and presented as an ideal. So it's more interesting to try and poke the holes in that because it isn't something that's done to the death uh, in, in media at the moment. Um, so yeah, so that I think is why it's deservedly a classic because it invites all these questions. And yeah, although you know, for me the, the systemic analysis was lacking a lot, um, the fact that the book provoked me to think about it myself in that way um, really speaks to its value. So if you haven't read this possessed yet, uh, if you're in for some kind of sociological critique, political science critique, um, and thinking about how we as humans should live together for the betterment of all, what we have to offer each other, on what basis solidarity should be founded, if it should be founded, what the role of government should be, how we can achieve organization so that people work together and therefore make all our lives better, and whether we you know, need some coercive force for that or not. Yeah, if you want to think about all of that, this is the book for you. So that was it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave me all your thoughts and comments down below, especially if you have read The Dispossessed uh, and have your own thoughts and opinions about it and think that I am wildly off the mark uh, in my analysis here. I'd love to hear it uh, and thank you for that and uh, see you next time.